Hello and welcome to the football show here on our game. It's myself, Shane Stilton, as always with Declan Bogue and Antrim football manager and All-Ireland winner with Tyrone Enda McGinley joins us also. How are you doing, man? Good, good. Privash. Good. Well, I suppose we'll jump straight into it, uh, Enda. You know, I mean, Monaghan, Tyrone, it's not really the most poisonous rivalry in the world. I think you're based there pretty much on the border of the two counties. Can you kind of talk about, like, any rivalry or such as it is between Monaghan and Tyrone ahead of the Ulster final? Yeah, I suppose Tyrone is one of them very popular counties in Ulster where you're you're disliked by most people. Uh, <laughs> but I suppose with, uh, with, with Armagh at the start of the noughties, that was the big one. Derry was the big one in the 90s with plenty of flashpoints in it. Donegal more lately. Uh, the big one to so Monaghan. Strangely enough, even though we, we've played a lot of big championship games with Monaghan, it's felt uh, for a good number of years or it was perceived for a good number of years that it was fairly one-way traffic uh, and so with that there wasn't a massive rivalry now in Malachi Rourke's time obviously he, he did turn the tables a couple of times uh, but Tyrone still managed to come out on top and ended up being the bigger team in terms of their, their All-Ireland runs uh, during that same spell so with that there it has never really taken off the ground Mono and folk are very pleasant Tyrone folk are very pleasant and, and they just seem to get on looking over the hedges at each other uh the a bar the bar the the mcmanus kavanagh issue which seemed to upset a dairy man more than anybody uh there there, there really hasn't been too many highlights yeah Declan. it's one of those ones that there's not a huge amount of a uh, cross-border pollination like i'm even closer to the border i can even see into monaghan from my living room uh and you know it's perhaps maybe people in this village might tend to go down to monaghan to do a bit more socializing and uh people from around that true car crane area might come up here uh to do their drinking especially because they can get in the indoor drinking now. <laughs> like that's a big thing for them but it's it's not something i've noticed definitely not maybe it wouldn't have been uh, the way that somebody from maybe the Moy or Eglish might feel in Armagh rivalry or the way that Ron McNamee in the past has talked about uh, the Donegal rivalry are certainly how like, well, I mean, you know, the, the friendly neighbours down in Fermanagh, like, you know, wouldn't, would, would kind of look fondly on Trillick uh, and, and Dramore in some ways. So it's, it's a strange one because they share a border and yet there's no rancour really. Yeah, so in the, moving into this um, Ulster final this year, you've obviously, I'm sure you've been watching it as close as anybody. Um, and the semi finals, I mean, unbelievably high scoring game between Monaghan and Armagh, finished 417 to 221. And then the other semi final, Tyrone 23 points, Sonny Gall 114, Michael Murphy getting sent off and missing the penalty in the first half. Of course, he wasn't right for that game. They were, they were throwing him in at the deep end. W what's your initial feeling going into this? Who do you think is kind of in the better form? Uh, it's very hard to say, and I suppose it's it's as much it's because you're you're if you look at the whole year now, which only extends to about four or five matches for either team, it's it's almost impossible to get any form line from anybody. Their initial league form is massively caveated by how much work they were able to do. Monon obviously got. I was I got caught out during during lockdown and 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 would have had to batten down the hatches while thrown. I know were very very disciplined in terms of sticking with the rules and i think that showed in their in their early league campaign they obviously had the hammering by Kerry, uh, which which sort of tailed off then the the league for them uh, but both teams you don't really know where where they're at bante being in his is a wee bit longer with them monaghan players those are monaghan players it's it's the spine of the team, I suppose, would be fairly settled. Not unlike Tyrone, I think both teams are are going through a period of change. They're both getting in newer, less experienced players, but they're still led by by the old campaigners who will be well familiar with each other this weekend. But in terms of trying to get a steer where both teams are, I think that's why this game's intriguing. You're you're looking at and even take the Monaghan game. Look at them in the first twenty minutes, and then look at them during the second half when when they were well. On, on the back foot against Armagh, it's difficult to get a difficult to get a hand on it. Coming away as a throne man, coming away from the throne game, I was massively impressed with them. And yet, re looking at it on the video, Donegal off colour without Michael Murphy, without Neil McGee, and yet it was only really in the last several minutes that throne actually pulled away from them. You know, so it it seemed a very impressive throne performance on paper, and it felt dominant when we were at the game. 
but maybe it just wasn't as as special as what it seemed so trying to pick which one is in form but bottom line as a as a thrown person thrown fan the history tells you thrown does well in this fixture not that the managers will both be saying that this doesn't matter at all for this one and thrown particularly that that dominance would would be felt more so in Crook Park thrown the last 10 minutes again Donegal seemed to find a, a confidence about themselves which, which looked new and felt new uh, and I'm wondering does that step up in all our gear in Crook Park if it does uh, I think Tyrone would be the form team for me, and that's literally going on their last ten minutes against Donegal. That's that's how little of a of a grounding that's based on. Yeah, exactly. Was that too? Like, if you look at the the game, I'm just going to check it here now. Was the uh, 66 minute of that game uh, of Tyrone Donegal? Uh, Michael Langan missed a free. That would this right. is. 66 Six minutes. He missed a free, which Michael Murphy would have tapped over. And in fact, I thought Michael Langan should have done better. And that would have been four minutes to go. Uh, Donegal one point adrift with a thrown kick out to come. Everyone pushed up like you know some seeds of doubt might have been coming into them. But as, at that stage too, Donegal had sort of ran out of ideas. Like the the only thing they had really, the weapon that they had was Owen Ban, uh, getting him on the ball and getting him to run straight in the D to try and draw fouls. Um, was there a wee bit of Donegal just running out of ideas a wee bit too and that, and that bench like the contribution of Conor McKenna and Tiernan McKenna especially you know just coming on and scoring yeah the, the, the energy particularly from, from that thrown bench and I suppose best encapsulated with, with Conor McKenna like he, he was just full of energy when he came on and it didn't matter fair enough the first few touches or the first few plays didn't work out brilliantly for him but you just seen a fella on a mission uh, and Cahill McKenna Cal McShane uh, took on again the, the good form that he showed again Calvin and just looked to be moving really really well Tiernan McCann again three players with lots of legs lots of physical size and I suppose we, we've seen that trend now in the game the county games are running to 80 minutes now uh, and it is that ability to throw on high caliber subs to close out the games come the last 20 minutes that's that's absolutely vital and Trona had that against Donegal where when you looked at the, at the Donegal bench it looked late uh, it it didn't look to the same power that that Tyrone had. So again, but that that's a very very strong thing for Tyrone to have. Like that that's that's not to say all oh, right. Well then, it was close enough between them and Donegal having that number, having nineteen twenty players. Like there was a couple of people still didn't get in the last day. Like Mark Bradley, I don't think got in the last day no. even. And uh, and again, he had done really well previously. Paul Donahue, I don't think uh, got in either. Uh, you know, two very prominent players from previous. So, like the Tyrone strength of depth is massive, uh, and I think the way the game has went, and the pace of the game, and the length of the game now in terms of injury times, and the way that games tend to have a natural gravity towards uh, being close, coming down the home straight. Uh, that that strength of the bench is is a big big fill up for for Tyrone. Yeah, just even building on to the point that you had, Declan, there about how little Donegal were scoring towards the latter end of the game. From the 48 minute to the end of the game, which was maybe 76 minutes, so give or take 28 minutes, Donegal only had one shot from playing the entire thing and, and Tyrone very much took over. So just um, your own experience, Enda, of the, the management team, Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar. I mean, Brian Dewar, I think everyone just remembers him running around up and down that right flank like an absolute train. What, what was he like in terms of his approach and what would he be demanding from his players? Because uh, all the sounds of it were like that he was just a brilliant trainer. Uh, yeah, from from Fergal and, and Brian's point of view, they're, they're two, they're, they're well matched in that they're slightly opposites from, from my experience of both of them. Uh, both, I suppose the, the, the unifying thing is they're both mass and massively genuine uh, throne men, first and foremost. Uh, Fergal, very gentlemanly, very steady in his thinking. Uh, Brian, a wee bit more led by the heart uh, and, and a wee bit more full of energy and, and, and aggression. And I think the two of them balance that out in each other. But it is surrounding them that, that you've got the real uh, coaching talent uh, that, that you would see. Like them two men bring massive experience and will bring a confidence with them uh, and a belief that they can always compete. But coaches are, are so important now and uh, Joe McMahon, Peter Donnelly, Collie Holmes, like a, that's an exceptionally strong coaching setup uh, that they have. Collie Holmes record is is phenomenal across the various teams that he's that he's taken by now. Uh, and Joe just has a massive 
character, a massive personality about him that you would just know would be brilliant with with within the squad. So I think that uh, as ever now, and, and speaking from my own behalf too, uh, as a manager, it's all really about the people that you build around yourself. Uh, to 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 go on with that, Peter Donnelly obviously speaks speaks for himself, or his his name rather speaks for itself at this stage, you know. But it's it's the entire package for Tyrone, which suits Brian and Fergal down to the ground. Neither of them would have egos uh, to to speak of as such. Uh, it's not about them as such. Uh, it's it's about that entire package, and, and you even see look Monaghan, Banty, McInerney went out, got Donny Buckley, like so. People might Banty sort of a larger than life character. And and sometimes it, it can seem it's 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 about Banty. He's such an interesting character. It, it he can take a lot of the the spotlight, and yet he went out and got big names in as well, both in the strength and condition. And obviously, Nick Nick from Throne, obviously they he crossed over, uh, but and Donny Buckley as well, one of the highest, uh, probably uh, recognised coaches in the game. Is there any sort of anecdote you'd have and about uh, Brenda and his drive, maybe? Is there a treadmill story that you've got up your sleeve? <laughs> treadmill stories that was down in the city west. I, I wouldn't be sure what throne year it was, but if we were staying in the city west, I'd imagine it was in round maybe oh, oh 03 potentially, uh, or else we couldn't get booked in uh, to, to to our usual place out in Carton House in 05. But uh, basically, I would have been, I would have fancied myself as one of the fitter guys within the throne squad simply because I, I didn't have many other strings to my bow bar work rate so, so, so if you're that sort of player you you, you better be able to run uh, and we were out killing a bit of time went out to the city west gym and i was in the gym a couple of other boys doing weights i was on on heading for the treadmill but before we we came into the gym doer was already there and I seen him over on the treadmill, and it was sitting at a brave, at a brave incline, like it wasn't sitting at one or two percent. It this was, this was sort of somewhere between a stairmaster and and a vertical climb, if you know what I mean. So this this was a significant climb, and it was Doer's characteristic run, which looked terrible, which looked as if he was ready to fall off and keel over, panting, unsteady, but just going, going, going. And I thought, right, well, I'll 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 saddle up beside the captain here and and show him what a good. What, what, what a good teammate I am. So I started running too. After five, ten minutes, a bit out of breath. My pace would have been similar to Duhers, but my incline certainly wasn't. Uh, and after about ten minutes, I was starting to struggle. And I was thinking, right, well, Duhers started here before me and obviously had quite a bit of done before me. I'm, I can't stop before him. So kept going, kept going. That was fine. Another three, four minutes. Yeah, definitely starting to struggle at this stage. Duhers still going strong beside me and by about twenty minutes, I was I was killed. Like we, we were only in to do a bit of a light workout. Like we we had all of the rest of our training weekend. This wasn't a, a definite part that had to be done. This was extra. Uh, after about twenty minutes, I was wrecked. So I stepped off. Here I'm I'm heading in here to her, and he just I that's all right, Andy. Sure, see you later. And he just kept on trucking. No 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 stopping at all. So Brian to her as a player for me. I think he might be one of them. I often think of them Olympic rowers and the, the cyclists that seem to be able to feel no pain and their body just does extreme stuff. Uh, apparently beyond the realms of the normal person and do her whatever his physiology was, he had that in some style. He could just run and run and run as many a, an opponent will testify. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, inspirational character, just no never never any softness in him in his attitude to opponents in his attitude to anything you hardened up and and you get on with it there was no excuses like brian to her is the ultimate no excuse culture and no you see uh, sorry to, but to interrupt you but, but see that uh the first league game they had maybe it wasn't the first i think it was the first against tony gall right in Haley park and at half time the players were just kind of head down walking off the pitch just strolling and uh, do her run to the tunnel and start screaming at them. So start, start running. Start. He starts screaming at them. Run in, run in here. We've got. We don't have that much time. And uh, you could see then that some of them just were woken up almost by that, and maybe taken aback. And you know, maybe that wasn't Mickey's way with them from before. But by God, they were going to show some uh, some better body language. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think he, he had a massive, massive role. Uh, and funny, I wasn't aware of that. Of it wasn't at that game. But uh, that that would stick exactly to do her. I know. And again, I think after the Kerry game, I think he, he led the video analysis, which would have been a fairly painful video analysis uh, mm-hmm. on whatever the Tuesday night, Monday or Tuesday night or whatever it was when, when they gathered after that match. And I think he went through them essentially for a shortcut. He just routinely named names and said simply not good enough, simply nowhere near county standard and was was massively blunt, massively pointed. But this is Brian Duher telling you it. You know, there's there's no way of questioning that. He's been there, done that. And again, there, there was never an ego about Brian Duher, the player, and there's not an ego about Brian Duher, the manager. And whenever he's telling you you're not good enough or that was not good enough, that, that was not worthy of, of of the of a county jersey, then you're 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 gonna buck up your ideas and that comfort zone that inevitably players, especially established players, can start entering into, uh, will have been blown apart. Uh, and I think between that and the continued training that the team has done, they they've emerged a much, much better side than than before that Killarney game. Mm. Uh, there's a comment in there from Park Gill saying Dewar was incredible. Talk about a career that wasn't conducive to inter-county football on top of it all. Uh, even that end up, but also even yourself trying to, to juggle, a bit. Bu- I'm sure you have a busy work life, kids, uh, on top of being an inter-county manager. How, how difficult is it? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. You need an understanding a spouse or a demanding spouse, one, one of the other, but I'll go for the understanding one. Uh, look, it's it's one of them things, and I think anybody with a young family or anybody working, and that, that's a huge number of people of a similar age group, life, life gets busy, and uh, COVID sort of showed us that whenever you cut everything out, you still fill it with other stuff. So I would maintain that if, if I wasn't doing the football end of things, would I feel any less busy now? Have I felt suddenly less busy over the past two, three weeks uh, since Anthem has wrapped up? No, I haven't. It's just filled with other stuff. So you, you tend to fill life with stuff. We all promised we wouldn't whenever we uh, returned from COVID again. I was speaking, I was over in Ahalu playing uh, the under 11s last week and speaking to their manager and he just told me yeah he's out every night of the week with with various children so everybody just fills their time with stuff uh, if you can do that with stuff you really enjoy if you can do it with boys that you really enjoy spending your time with and that's some speaking of the, the coaching team that, that, that i have around me uh, then you can tend to get a lot out of it uh, as long as you can find a balance and make sure that you're given decent quality of time to say on, in my account the, the family or you can continue keeping your head above water in the work front uh, then you go on and you're, you're you're living life to the max maybe not how what everybody would would uh, ascribe to but uh, look you you're you're there because you've signed up to it you want to do it to the best of their ability and there's 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 great enjoyment and there's great feeling that that you're you're pushing yourself and you're exposing yourself to new challenges and that's that's what life's about i suppose and can I jump jump in there and just say I, I just noted something that uh, Patrick Hampshire said earlier on the week. He said that the bunting and the flags were out in in Coal Island, um, and that's probably because obviously because he's the captain and they haven't had a, a county captain since Kieran Core. Uh, but I mean, around between your house and my house, let's just say. Got me a flag cane. There's no bunting. Uh, even in 2018, when Tyrone reached the All Ireland final, I think it it took until the middle of the week before anything was seen in the Ballygolly roundabout. Uh, you know, draw the contrast to maybe your first All Ireland final in 03, where the place was simply festooned and everything upright was covered in red and white. I mean, number one, uh, is you know, did Tyrone just get used to it and then the thing just fade because you still see if you're ever down Kerry in the summer it'll be covered in green gold uh, is it the local lodges don't really permit it and, and number three how does it feel as a player uh, is there any effect when you're driving to training because like, I would have read before autobiographies where players said that they were absolutely buzzing because they saw bunting and if they don't see any bunting and it's the week of an all-iron final week of an Ulster final, it must be kind of, but you must feel a wee bit cheated. Uh, from from the from the bunting point of view, being up at the Ulster final stage, that's a wee bit of a surprise. Uh, obviously, Kalein with, with Padraig Hamshie and, and Don that Hamshie's in, in 
absolutely phenomenal form at the minute. Like he has just been massive for for Troni. He's an absolute joy to watch in terms of a defender at the absolute top of his game and and thriving with the less protection that he has around him because you're really seeing him be him. Uh, mm. I think he's massively impressive at the minute. But uh, mm. it's good to hear there's some bunting out. Certainly that 2018 final was a huge disappointment for me. And I did, funny, I remember thinking that at that time. It's a real pity for the players because it's it's not that it's not that as a player it, it matters massively for you. Like you've 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 a performance to put in and you've preparations to make, but at least it sort of shows mm. that people are out and people are excited and you want to see people excited about it. I think there is a genuine excitement building within Throne about about this team and, and the direction it's heading. I think part of the issue this year is the fact that you, people aren't getting to the games and it's just not the same whenever you're you're in the cars or, or sorry, at, at home. I, I think heading out on, on the day trips, seeing all the traffic out together, seeing people at matches, I think that helps build the excitement and that has obviously been limited this year. It'll build a wee bit better after the Ulster final, but again, 18,000 in Croke Park. I would I would reckon you'd have a much better atmosphere with five thousand in, in the athletic grounds than eighteen thousand in Croke Park, mm-hmm. but uh, it is what it is. I think uh, if Tyrone can get over and if the manner of their display is appropriate, well then I think you'll start to see a bit of excitement uh, building. Then all right, but certainly twenty eighteen was was a really peculiar year. I don't know whether it was because it was Dublin you were coming up against, and maybe the deep down the belief wasn't quite there. Uh, I don't know. Or, uh, but at this stage, I think with with the new management and a new team and the feeling of a new era, uh, I I think there's there's the potential for for increased excitement if if progress can be made. Uh, I'm wondering, and uh, do you do you think it's a good thing that the Ulster final is on in Croke Park in the sense that it will give a dry run for Monaghan or for Tyrone when they're up against Kerry? And like you said, like maybe Tyrone need to play as many big games there as possible, and then also just the forward options. Um, I believe you had Der- Derek Halvin when he was a minor with the club. Uh, hopefully he's back. But like the potential of the forward line with, with Tyrone there, McKenna, McShane, if they were all fully fit and playing, like the potential is as good as any team in Ireland. Yeah, absolutely. The potential in that forward line is, is massive. And in terms of getting to Crook Park, look, for every player you want to get to Crook Park, uh, you want to play there. The more regularly you can play there, the better. I, I would argue that anybody that doesn't think that's not a massive advantage to to Dublin, uh, how frequently they play in Crook Park. Uh, but for Throne, absolutely, it's brilliant to be there. For the supporters, it's great that more people can go there uh, for the for the creation of a brilliant atmosphere at the match. It, it, I don't think it'll make a massive difference, but at least more people are seeing it, uh, which is good. And for the players, it's brilliant. Uh, and from a Throne point of view, I do think it tips the balance of the match a wee bit in, in Throne's favour. But going back to your point about the Throne forwards, absolutely. Uh, that's it is, and it was common. There, there's a lot of sort of the, the quick analysis or the lazy analysis for me that's happening a lot at the minute is that, oh, well, Mickey Hart's gone and suddenly there's more attacking talent. Mickey Hart essentially was the one that, that went with Cahill McShane at full forward when it seemed a very strange move. I remember still in the early National League games that it was happening, it seemed very strange. Stevie O'Neill done a wondrous job of him, in fairness. And I know Stevie felt Cahill was, was a brilliant pupil as such and, and really worked uh, really worked his socks off and just was massively diligent about everything that, that he'd done and exceptionally capable, as it turned out, at, at that full forward role. And then Mickey obviously had a big say in getting Conor McKenna back, and, and obviously he was back in too. Dara is the age now that he's ready to step up to, and Darren McCurry was always there. So Throne were trying to play that more men inside game. They were trying to combine their longer, more direct play with their counter-attacking play that obviously had been perfected under Mickey. Uh, and I don't see anything massively, massively different now other than the general trend in the game where we're not seeing people immediately turn on their heel and run back in into their defense it might have been the classic sort of defensive era approach from sort of three four years ago but that that's they're just tweaks and and tactics as such uh, for me Tyrone are playing a 
a style of game which I think most modern teams are now heading towards for the vast majority of games. That's not to say any game like Derry showed against Donegal, they will teams are well able to change it up on their day and be more defensive orientated than maybe attacking orientated and maybe choose to push up less on kickouts depending on who the goalkeeper is or how that third bias works out uh, in terms of them things on on Sunday. Uh, again, the thrown attacking power and the running power means that they'll be more than happy to try to keep men up and play that modern type of game. And I think the, the biggest discovery for me, so that forward attacking talent for me was there. The biggest discovery for me is the potential combination of Con Kilpatrick and Brian Kennedy in, in midfield, uh, because that suddenly gives thrown options in terms of executing a better high press or being able to break an opposition's high press, which are two very, very key things in the modern game, down uh, physically uh, having a big team and, and really struggling. I think any team that doesn't have a bit of a uh, size in that middle third can find themselves under punishing 10, 15 minute spells of games where a lot of damage can be done. Mon and Arma, interestingly, sort of equaled each other out. I don't think either team is particularly strong in the middle, or not strong in the middle third, but particularly big in the middle third. Uh, and I think that's a potential area that Throne can dominate uh, Monaghan a wee bit in, in terms of that aerial supremacy in the middle third and that ability then from that to push up more uh, on Monaghan and try and put the squeeze on, on the beg and kick out. And, uh, um, and it's not... Uh, this is a tricky, it's a tricky point to bring up and, and it's very important not to be trite or anyway about it like obviously monaghan have been suffering the county have been suffering and the loss of, of brandon o'duffy and um you have unfortunately some experience of being in teams and, and having lost teammates uh you know paul mcgarr and and cormac mcconnell of course like can you give us a little bit of insight into then preparing for a big game you know with that huge emotional cloud hanging over you um, and obviously, I'd, just to make the point that as far as uh, everything has gone from on us, as far as I can make out, they've conducted themselves with the utmost of dignity and, and done so well in, in, in the wake of this. But can you tell us then from the football end of it, if that's not the trade? Yeah, like so the 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 normal things to to say will be that it's it's they're they're not in a crusade that this isn't all about them and and mickey hart was always very clear about that when, whenever we suffered our, our various uh, losses unfortunately uh and that's because in in the game of in football as in sport there is never any guarantees so if you make it as if you can only do honor a uh, to that person by winning a game you, you, you can't guarantee that and what happens then when you lose but w what I will say in, in terms of within Monaghan at present I can only imagine that the support and the goodwill that those players will have it is way beyond the sort of raucous putting up bunting happy clappy support that a winning team gets from their supporters it is a raw deep uh, pride and honour as Monaghan people uh, they've they've seen one of their their young people tragically lost one one of their young leaders tragically lost, uh, and they will be bonded together by by a sense of identity, uh, and a sense of pride, and that is very very powerful stuff coming out in a game like this. And it's it's win or lose, it doesn't matter. They will be proud Monon people, and there will be massive backing for that Monon senior team to go out and represent the Monon County team. Uh, and win or lose, that pride will be there and the players will know that that will be a win or lose pride and backing of them. And that is a massive thing for players to go out. There, there is a, a deep drive within you, a, a real a real want to stand up and just do things right and, and to go to the better end, wh whatever it brings. And I, I do expect a pretty special Monaghan performance, a massively charged Monon performance. I don't think they can switch that off. Uh, but it's it's not so much that it's a crusade or it's a, it'll certainly not be a, a dressing room speech. It's it's just mm. simply you say it's that's that's just too trite. But uh, in terms of the power that it gives you in the backing of your people and the unity of the people, uh, it's it's a it's a strong place and it, it will definitely be a factor in the background and in that Monon dressing room. Yeah. And, and David performance. 
And Andy, you've been very good at your time. Just before we let you go, could I just ask you, what way do you see it going? It'll probably be a very tight game, one kick of a ball, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it'll be tight game. I think, again, it'll be quite open. I, I think both teams will feel that they can get at uh, the opposition. For me, the matchups on the throne side, I really love the, the form of, of the throne defenders. I know we speak a lot about the forwards, but the, Michael O'Neill looks exceptionally comfortable at centre-half back. Petey Hart, now that he's just been let be a really, really good wing half back, that's a really strong position now for Drone Podrick. Hampshire, I've spoke already, is in amazing form at the minute. Ronan McNamee and, and Michael McKinnon at the back as well. So Drone, where, where I would have been worried previously uh, that maybe Drone needed that defensive blanket, I think those defenders are showing that they don't. And I think Jack McCarran is the main man for me. I know, obviously, McManus is... is, is Connor McManus, he just the, the doer of wondrous things, uh, and so he will need marked as ever. But Jack McCarn is the conductor, or appears to be the conductor of that man on forward line, and has been doing it in amazing form. I think he'll get much, much more attention from Throne than maybe other opponents have given him, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. And I think Throne have the man markers to go and do that, uh, and then in, in the middle third, as I've sort of spoke about already, I do think Throne's. A newfound midfield pairing it gives gives a, a, an aerial dominance that maybe they haven't had so much in the past, or certainly that partnership just looks very well balanced. Obviously, Colm Cavanagh has spent a huge amount of his time on the more defensive side of the things, but uh, th them two boys look a really nice, energetic, young partnership. Now, with that, experience counts on big days too, so they, they have to go out and, and earn their corn. But for me, the overall balance of that throne team looks very, very strong. Uh, and, and I struggle to see anything other than a Monon win, but at the same stage, I am expecting a pretty special Monon performance. I think it'll be a great game, to be honest. I, I think it'll be a, a good, uh, a really good quality game from two teams that, because of everything that has happened, there, there'll be no interest in sort of shenanigans or crap in round it. I think they'll both just want to be getting playing football. OK, well, Enda, really appreciate you joining us. That's brilliant insight and analysis. And you're heading off for a couple of days, so enjoy the break. Will do, will do. Cheers, Shane. Daglan. All the best. Good luck, Enda. OK, Declan, so he tees it up nicely there. Now, you, you've seen plenty of these two teams. Uh, throughout would, you, the year. Would, you, uh, would you have stuck with Doher? Shane, would you have just, you just toughed it out? Absolutely not. You know what? I did one of those VO2 max tests before. Oh, okay. on the treadmill. Yeah, you, the one on the treadmill, you've got the thing in your face, like Bane from Batman, and you're running as hard as you can for as long as you can. And I did it in UCD, and my God, I calved after... I think I did it for... Was it something like 15 minutes or something like that? And I just calved. I couldn't stay going. The legs just went from under me. I was hyperventilating. I was all over the place. I wouldn't get near Brian Dewar. And you kind of mentioned that this was when he was in his early 30s. I mean, it's one thing doing it when you're in your early 20s. This was in your 30s. Horrible. Yeah, I mean, he, he's just as hard. He's just a hard, hard man. I mean, uh, shouldn't shouldn't really be saying this but uh a couple of years ago i was involved helping out with a senior team and and um we were playing away at, at brian Duhurst club and he was kind he was the club chairman at the time and uh it was it was in the april and it was about the second or third league game in but it was absolutely freezing and i mean up there in clanagale it's a pretty open spot and there was a wind coming that would have just whip the ankles off you like you know uh two pairs of socks three hoodies four t-shirts the whole lot and we walked in there's just there was a, a geezer just bubbling along nice hot water and it happened this <laughs> brand new restaurant and said it's brand would, would you mind could i have a cup of coffee there can i stop myself and uh on he at me he at me he says if I, the moment that he opened that geyser then the hot water would turn cold and he would have to be making tea for 40 people and all the rest but it just he wouldn't even get like literally he wouldn't even give you a cup of coffee coming up the road that's i don't know if that was part of the competitor or what happened you know what i think i think it may have been well, we aren't you worse being that windy looking for? Will you get out there and get stuck in unless you're? <laughs> <like users and, laughs> I mean, uh huh. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, come here. You have seen an awful lot of these teams. You know, uh, Throne and Monaghan <laughs> fairly much inside out. I just reflected on the semi-final between Monaghan and Armagh, four seventeen to twenty-one. 
four goals in the first half, yet Armagh reeled them back in with 10 to go. They even went ahead. And yeah. Conor McManus, you know, Mr. Ice himself, everything is going crazy around him, and he's Mr. Ice. He's that difference, mate. That's the point people nearly uh, failed to recognise. He was he he hit the three frees. I know Stephen Nahan and then got the... They were two down, and he was fouled three times. And anyone who wants to say and either of them was uh, a dive or uh, that he manufactured the free. Uh, well, every forward can. Um, I'm not saying that they weren't frees. They absolutely were frees. But if you carry the ball across, around... You try to dip the shoulder past the defender, then it is the defender's responsibility to tackle you clean. And he wasn't tackled clean. I mean, one of them, he actually ended up on the ground with someone who had him in a headlock. Uh, there were three frees, and he nailed them. And by, like, they were tricky enough frees. It's not even tricky enough frees, but they were in the 75th and whatever minute. I mean, I'm going to just. Uh, Check now, like, uh, but well, that's that's it, not surprising from him. Like, if if most, and you even mentioned there he was all, the free was, take went right. Four minutes, seventy one minutes, seventy five minutes, three frees, Neil each one, and in the meantime, Ray O'Neill missed a free, and uh, another arm ass sub missed a hit away. I think it was Tiernan Kelly. But the point of the matter is, you talk about that scoring, but I do believe it's grand and all. You can talk about Ulster teams cancelling each other out and having serious amount of tactical work done on each other. And sometimes that can lead to, say, an all or an Ulster semi-final like there was in 2018, where I think for I think for Mana beat Monon like one eight, one ten to like by a point with a last minute goal punch by Owen Donnelly, right? And that was one of those classic chessboard uh, games where Monarchy Rourke was managing against his home county. He was managed against his former player, Rory Galler. Rory Galler had come up against Monaghan uh, in the Ulster finals of 12, 2012 and 2013. Mm, yeah, I think, I think, no, 2012, I think it was down. But anyway, like there was a period of time there where uh, Donegal and Monaghan were just playing each other flat out, and, and uh, he was with the Donegal management against Monarchy Rourke. So then there's other days. The, the other days are, are games like Donegal killed there in 2011, uh, Armand Monaghan. They just take on a, a life of their own and they become nothing about the management. The management cannot affect those games. I don't believe, I think that, that you know, we sometimes you rightly give an awful lot of credit to managers, how they have the team set up and so on. But some days you send them out and whatever mood is stirring, whatever way just events transpire and open up there's just contests and then you have absolutely no effect can i I'd make a point on that Kildare Donegal game in 2011 i was at that game and i, I just the atmosphere was unbelievable it was nowhere near full of crow park that day yeah. but it was a horrendous game for 50 minutes then the final yeah. i don't know if people remember this this is the game where kevin cassidy hit that unbelievable winner beautiful kick from around the 45 or just outside but it was a horrendous game for 45, 50 minutes. Then the rest of the normal time was brilliant. Then injury, our extra time was just absolutely insane. And some days you just have to rely on your leaders to do something. Like you've mentioned Conor McManus there. Some days you just need the leaders to step up. Look at Mayo the last day. Again, like they have leaders and maybe Galway just don't have enough of them. And maybe in this game here, like Tyrone and Monaghan, who's the biggest leader on the field? Conor McManus perhaps, but maybe Tyrone have more of them. I mean, it's tough on the call. Yeah, I mean, if you even bracket them, like, you know, Darren Hughes is there. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, my God, what a warrior he has been, like, and, and continues to be. Neil Kearns is floating about there, uh, you know, is in and out of the team. Kelly Novell looks to me as someone who could develop into that. Ryan Wiley is a cast iron class act. Um, but I'm, I'm going to say one thing. I honestly... For stop me if I've said this before. We were talking about Ray McInnesby one other time, were we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you know, we were talking about there's a middle eight player sort of prototype. I, I just I don't know if there's anyone better than them. maybe Neil Scully might might have more skill than him, but like for sheer energy, game intelligence, how to read it. It was him that that nabbed the three ball from Stephen Campbell at the end of that game. And that's that's one of those stats that people will. That's one of those passages of play that people will ignore because they're all drawn to the fact that 
uh, Connor hit the last three frees and St Stephen O'Hanlon. But without that hand up, without that tackle, without that interception, and then working the ball forward, Mullen wouldn't be in the championship probably. Yeah, I, I'm sure you watched it last weekend, or at the very least highlights. But Kerry steamroll in Cork, and then the um, the goal we were on top. I think it was like two five to six points at halftime. I'm pretty sure I have it here somewhere. Two five yeah, to six. Yeah, the position we had no shade too. Like. Yeah, and like because he was having a very tough time, and Paul Conroy in the first half, he came into the game. Mayo just took over as well. What a, a couple of the things that stood out to me, and you can sort of apply this to the Armagh Monaghan game with their players if you like, is what Mayo did with Conor Gleeson, the goalkeeper for Galway. They allowed it, they forced him to go along a few times, and it didn't go right. And a couple of times he went to carry the ball out. You know, it was recycled back to him. And generally, a keeper needs these days, as the Ar sorry Monaghan and Tyrone keepers will be, comfortable bringing the ball out the field. Should we see Niall Morgan go up and hit for, uh, scores from the 45? But they, they allowed him to come out, and they wouldn't allow him any passing options. And ultimately, he got uncomfortable and booted the ball 60 yards. And, you know, you're gifting away a possession, which you just can't do in Gaelic well, football these days. a very clever thing to do. Yeah. Well, so thing to do because the, the temptation then is always, uh, you know, that you will, you will eventually leave your man uh, to try and cut out the pass and he just pops it over your head and then it's a one two and then all of a sudden then they're out they're out of that pressure square or whatever you did that that you can't corral the goalkeeper and push him down the wing or whatever like that and you know you might see more of that you might say right okay well you know yes you did it but we are going to test just how good you are uh, and a lot of these players are a lot of these goalkeepers are fine footballers but a lot of them aren't being tackled um uh and you know what? I think of all those players then that, that might be best equipped with that is probably Neil Morgan because he plays midfield for Eden Dork all the time. Um, and he's a fine, out, fine outfield player, like a proper player outfield, all the skills. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to see just if, if Tyrone, if, if Rory Baggin comes so far. And that's one of the things about uh, that one of those final scores from Conor McManus was he's taken the free. There's a, a picture I saw the other day of it. In direct line between Connor and the goals was Rory Began. Like he was that far up, like you know, he was ahead of the free where it was being taken. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, well, like keepers need to be brave these days. I, like as a manager, when you're looking at Niall Morgan standing outside the 21 to try and cut out passing lanes, and in some I generally see this from kickouts. Now you get to more of the games because you're based in that part of the country to see the Ulster Championship more often. But he bases himself maybe 20, 25 yards out from goal sometimes when he thinks that the opposition will go for a long kick out. But mm -hmm. then you're like, well, what if this goes wrong? I mean, you know, largely it probably won't go wrong because you'll get back in time. But you do need brave keepers and keepers that don't mind if they're going to get the ball. And, you know, one of the things that separates Dublin, and you saw this against Mead later on when they held the ball for about four minutes and Mead just could not get near them. They're a team that doesn't, it doesn't matter to them if they, they have the ball for four minutes. Whereas other teams and certain players get spooked if they have it for more than a minute. They feel like, well, we should try and burst through here and they get turned over. So that, I think that'll be a big part of this game. They must, play long, they must play long, laborious games in training like that where it literally is keep up. Like, we'll reward you with a goal every five minutes or something like but that. You, you, you know as well that a lot of time uh, when you do keep all things at training, it's, it might be like four bollards around and you're in a tight little area and you, you're trying to keep it away from players, and it's frenetic. But a lot of time they do it away from danger, so they're just happy to keep it on the flanks, move it back 10 yards. There isn't really, like, three or four lads tackling them there. So, that, like, it's just a different level of patience. It's like what Tyrone, Tyrone did that to Calvin, too. Once they got ahead, yeah. there was about two or three moments or passes play where they just took three minutes out of the ball before either an attempt or a shot or a point or whatever, and that... That kind of just made Calvin's challenge wilt. And people say chasing the ball is hard, like keeping the ball is damn hard too. Like, you know, mm. but it requires courage. And you can see the lads who are hiding. Uh, and, and, you know, but at that level, you, nobody's hiding. Like, I mean, I can remember watching a goalkeeper in Division Three, uh, Fermanagh goalkeeper, God love him, like, in a, in a game. Fermanagh had been relegated uh, the year before and they were, they were going down again. And this was against Louth, and the goalkeeper came out like, and he got to the, he got to the twenty-one, and nobody wanted it, like absolutely nobody wanted. It. And he was stood there, solo and bouncing, static, for about thirty seconds, uh, until like eventually he just 
he got frustrated and had absolutely leathered up the field. Uh, but you know, when a team's going like it, it requires confidence, and when a team's going bad, a couple of bad defeats, like then, oh boy, that's that's dangerous stuff to play then. Yeah, do you do you have a, do you favor Tyrone or Monaghan in this final, and and who do you think will be the key man? I would have favored Donegal almost for Ulster, but um, no, what I would really think that that it's Tyrone's to lose, like just because of this, the panel strength, like Monaghan were able to bring Stephen O'Hanlon on. Not quite sure what a sort of star quality here. If we can just check him. Will, will Tyrone also? Well, they brought on Tiernan McCann, Connor McKenna, and Kyle McShane. They probably brought on one or two others, but I mean that's serious power. I mean, I'd like to see Kieran Hughes be the same player he was back in 2013, you know, or, or 2015, like in the Ulster final, I think, when he, he, he absolutely demolished um, the Donegal full back line. Uh, we're eight years on, and he's just, uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, injury or whatever, he's not, he's just not seen in the same light, or he's just not getting the same sort of minutes. Uh, what did he get? He came on 63rd minute against Fermanagh, Possibly later against Armagh, uh, Fenton Kelly, who was a fine, fine player, um, centre back. They just, they just look to have different options. Like they still have Kieran Duffy, still a very understated, underrated player. Connor Boyle for me, it's been a brilliant player in forcing the issue and pushing up another team sweeper and forcing them sort of, sort of pushing their defence around a wee bit. Uh, Wiley, unbelievable marker. Um, oh, look, you know, there's just there's just there is an awful lot of quality in that Monaghan team. Uh, and if Monaghan hurt them in any way, I know that and I was talking about Con Patrick and um, uh, Brian Kennedy in the Trump midfield, but like arguably, like there's a there's a better Monaghan midfield there, uh, early, and that's what it'll count. Like, I'm not sure that Darren Hughes or Killian Lavelle are out jumping or out fielding Kennedy, uh. Or, or Con Kilpatrick, but the truth is that Tyrone conceded every more or less every Donegal kick out. And mm. so what was the you know, you can talk about these two strapping lads, they are monstrous fellas. Like they're Did you not think that they were kicking long and the two big boys were tapping it down for Tyrone to try and get the breaks and, and, and break? Very few. I counted the, the, the kick outs, I keep a note of them, but but the vast majority of it was they were just letting Sean Patton hit the corner had Owen McFadden Ferry, I had Steve McManaman, like he was they were getting away all the time. And then I, think, I was thinking more for Tyrone's own kick out, their own kick out, that they were targeting those men to, to knock it on for somebody to collect on their own. Yeah, well that, that, that that's a favoured Donegal tactic, isn't it? Oh Tyrone yeah. tactic. I was thinking more uh, the two big boys for Tyrone in the middle were doing that a couple of times. They were they were tapping it down. Yeah. Right, okay. But you're, anyway, we might need to watch that one back to. I, I kind of favour Tyrone here. I mean, though, all those yeah. attacking threats they have. I would. I still do wonder that. I can fully understand why Declan Bonner and, and Stephen Rochford and, and so on decided to start Michael Murphy. I kind of get it. Rather than bringing him on and having to take him back off if he can't last, start him and see how you go. But it did spectacularly blow up in their face. I mean, Mike, yeah, well, you know, no, especially I, Murphy now hindsight and all that like mm. but, uh, we are looking at that first game against down and just saying why on earth did they do that i mean that was just ridiculous stuff like you know yeah. uh, you know and then the other side of it right you have to recognize these people aren't taking risks like with people's health like you know there's a whole donegal medical team dr kevin moore is still there like one of the most respected and High profile, I suppose, doctors in the GA, like he's been on the, the scientific welfare committee of the GA. So, Dr. Kevin Moore, there's no way Declan Bonner didn't take his advice. Um, he must have been past fit and ready to go, passed his fitness test, done all the sort of stress tests on the muscle, and said, Well, he's good to go. And I mean, what do you do? You're playing uh, down, it's in Uri. You kind of have to get a few minutes into the legs. You, you know, if, if things were comfortable, you may have taken them off around the 45, 50 minute mark. They didn't get an opportunity to do that. And they only just, uh, they only aggravated it more. And that's to me exactly why the red card came about because uh, even the, 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 the black card, as it was given for a trip on Kieran McGeary, that was just someone who I don't believe wanted to risk his hamstring by bending over with someone charging straight at him. Uh, I think that's why he kind of just tried to tip it or have a an old flake at it. 
it was the strangest thing because Michael Murphy does not flake in a loose ball. Just a, it was pure frustration. And it just looked to me that the season just was going through his hands like he was just trying to hold it like water in his hands. And the season was just getting away on him. And he just let it fly. And I don't believe they even saw McGeary come on like that. But he, he, he lifted him. And it was, a, it was another yellow card, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what did you make of, uh, just briefly before we go on to the Leinster final, what did you make of Cork and, and Mayo last weekend? They're at the opposite side of the All-Ireland semi-final draw. But it, wouldn't it be just Mayo to to beat Dublin in All-Ireland semi-final, assuming that Kildare uh, exit in the Leinster final stage, and then go on and lose to Kerry in the final? That's kind of my prediction. Yeah. <laughs> it has that feeling to it, doesn't it? That's a bit cruel. It is a bit cruel. And yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love to see Mayo do it. Genuinely, I would. I think most people would. Uh, mm. They're they're just a kind of romantic staple at the at this point. Like you know, and uh, by God, you got you you have to give Horn um, credit because I remember when he came back for the second time, and there was an interview with Aidan O'Shea who had mentioned that. Uh, you know, he was asked, "Is everyone glad to see James Horn back?" And he said, "No, a bit, bit nervous to be honest, because the first time he took over, he wasn't afraid to, to you know, slaughter a few sacred cows. Uh, people that were regulars on the team were no longer required. Even someone like Tom Parsons didn't even make it. Like he was a big figure in 2010, gone by 2011. Um, <clears throat> and I suppose Aidan O'Shea might have felt that something similar could have happened to him, and." You know, it could have been, it, it would be nice for the like of, you know, Colin Boyle to be still playing regularly. It would be nice for Keith Higgins to still be getting 20 minutes at the end of games. He doesn't do that sentimentality. He's got his own man now. He's got the that, that Spain, that O'Hara, Oshin Mullen. My God, like, you know, you, Owen McLaughlin coming in there, Dermot Conner, like, it's, uh, Paddy Durkin. It's, it's a flaying outfit. It is an absolute tanks of men rapid speed like like i remember years ago kieran mcginney saying they're the hardest hitting team in ireland and again you just you have to say they're right up there again like um even look at tommy conroy like tommy conroy looks like he was eating weights over the winter but he's flying around he's got he's got everything going in the right direction yeah it's it's just you know there must be such a high bar to get into that setup like and, and then just high standards expected of you thereafter. Yeah, it was tough going watching watching uh, Cork after going one five to three points ahead. They lost the rest of the game four nineteen to four points. I mean, yeah. geez, there's no analysing that the team just fell apart. No, no they just fell apart and, and, and crumbled and oh, it was grisly. Um, and there's not much you can say much more than that because. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, nothing. Like, and do, do you think Kildare could do that in this final? Like, jump back a couple of years. So their last final was twenty seventeen, and they did all right against Dublin. You know, they they were within a couple of scores at the end of the game. I spoke with Daniel Flynn a few a few weeks back, and he talks about how that that one on one save that Stephen Cluxon made against him still eats him up now and again. Player of that quality probably, you know, he feels he should have finished. He should have finished it, and and who knows? But you know, Kildare they haven't been there since twenty seventeen. You, I just wonder if there's a required level of aggression because you can talk all you want about systems and uh, shape and all the rest. It's highly, highly important. But I think when you're playing Dublin, the one thing that you have to do is match them for aggression. I mean, Kerry did that in the, the final in, in 2019 and Mayo did that for the first half of last year's final uh, and thereafter couldn't sustain it. The role of the bench. Now when you're looking at saying Dublin, where are they at in terms of squad strength? Like, you know, nowhere near where they were before. Nobody can dispute that. So what you've got to do is just soften them up and let's see, right, let's see what shape the replacements are in now and having to have them yourself. Now, do Kildare have the required depth as well as the required levels of aggression? Do they have the people that can implement it? That's what it's all about. Like, it is, it's, 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 what will beat Dublin in the end will be the team who just are manic about it. You know, as the old saying goes in Tyrone years ago, they used to talk about being psycho, absolutely psycho for the ball. If you if you're psycho for the ball, that's the bottom line. 
against Dublin. And if you're not, then you know, just if you're not, then Dublin will just get a few points ahead of you, and then they'll just slowly go about like killing the game, killing your chances of getting back into the game, just strangling you with all the just built up knowledge and muscle memory and so on. Mm, we'll finish up now shortly, but. Kildare did beat Westmead 214 to 8 points, 18 points in their semi final. Neil Flynn scored seven. Daniel Flynn and Jimmy Highland, and, and Highland has looked good anytime I've seen him, scored 1 1 apiece. And, you know, there are a couple of injury concerns there, but there's plenty of good forwards in that team. There's plenty of scoring power. But I'm like yourself, I do worry will they produce that sort of manic level of aggression required. But, like, if you're going to catch Dublin, who are 44 games unbeaten in the championship at this stage, they they were very poor against Mead in that second half. From two eleven to six ahead, they only scored two points up until the seventy third minute. So that's going, you know, that's that's thirty eight minutes of the second half where they just scored two points, and you know that is not Dublin. And beating Wexford fifteen seven, that's not really Dublin. And collapsing in the second half of the of the the league clash with uh, Kerry down in Turles when they scored just one three, none of this is Dublin. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, you know, they're just so far off what we've seen from before, but all judgment will be reserved until uh, until the, the game this Sunday. Like, you know, then that will shape everything thereafter. Um, is there, if the, you'd like to think that if there is a, a big kick in them, it's going to come uh, because they have been real flat track bodies. So if they can get a good jump in this game, then you need to see a double figure winning margin uh the only like i mean the only thing that i find a little bit possibly frustrating uh, I, I just don't buy it i hate to see it like as you know bookmakers say after that weekend that we had last weekend oh Kerry are suddenly seven to four favorites for the all uh, and and dublin are second favorites and like i just wonder like just how much money is actually laid on the back of things like that you know if you know a bookmaker puts an email out to um to media outlets a media outlets reported as a news story i think this i i actually think it's repulsive to be honest because then the media outlets are just pushing the job giving free advertising to betting companies um i i i I've got a real distaste for that because I don't believe that anyone say, God, Carrier captain, so I better load a few pounds here on Car- because Carrier are strong favourites. I find yeah. it an abhorrent practice in general. I think most media outlets would ignore that sort of email. They might mention it somewhere oh. in their article, but I don't think too many mention the names of the media. That's all they need. All they need is one line. Yeah. But you, like, there, there's a certain logic to it, too. It just means that Dublin have to play three games to win in All-Ireland, whereas Kerry have to win two. So I'm not, I'm not you know, on board with, the, with putting those emails out there or, or, or maybe um, advertising it. But that's mm-hmm. probably where the logic is coming from, if that matters. And maybe it but anyway, yeah. look, that's that's probably the height of it. Any final thoughts before we head into a big football weekend? I mean, it's two two provincial semi finals, and maybe the Olympics being on or whatever. It just feels that there hasn't been too much talk about it. It's just the COVID times that we're in. Like, I mean, it's just such a lack of everything. Like, you know, I mean, Ulster, you know, in years gone by, there was a real cottage industry of of uh, nights out where you would have discussion panels lined up, like you'd have the like of the, everyone would be bulling to try and get Joe Brawley into their clubhouse because that probably adds another 200 people in at the door, paying a tenner each uh, to see uh, uh, Thomas Niblock or whoever chair a panel discussion. And I don't really think that that sort of culture just, it carries as much in other provinces, certainly not in Leicester, nobody cares. But you know, even just the, the your off the ball road shows, all these kind of things, they're not a thing of the past because of COVID. Uh, and it's when you flick on the radio in the evening, you're less likely to hear these kind of, you know, in depth. And even though some of them got, some of them can be corny, like whether you know, in my day and, and we, we, we turfed your man's mattress out into the, <laughs> into the hotel lobby and all these kind of like war stories. Like, and, uh, but at the same time, it all generated, um, it all generated a huge thing. Like there's not a, Newspapers used to have supplements for Ulster finals. Like it ain't happening anymore, and um, that's just, I think it's just a, a just a knock-on effect of COVID at the moment. Yeah. 
Well, here's hoping that they're good finals. I expect the Ulster final will be for sure. But the, yeah. the Leinster one, it's fingers crossed more than anything else. And hopefully it is. But uh, anyway, enjoy the weekend. And uh, thanks as ever for joining us for the football show. We'll be chatting again next week. Uh, we may talk about the Nicky Racker and the Laurie Maher finals then too. Yeah, well, I've already previewed them. So actually have a look there. I spoke with former Tyrone hurler Cahill McIrlain about those. So have a look okay. at them, for them on the playlist. Right, cheers, Declan. Good luck to you.